Hello and welcome back. If you've always been intrigued by private equity or venture capital, then this video channel is for you. But before we dive into the questions that you may have and some of the details, we want to make sure that everyone is on the same page and everyone speaks the same language. In part one of this introduction, I walked you through the uh, brief overview over the private equity and venture capital market right now. We spoke about dry powder and we touched a little bit on the mechanics, on the functioning on private equity and venture capital funds. Part two will focus exactly on that. What do private equity and venture capital funds do? How do they execute it? How do they gain access to those private companies? And we will have a quick look over the life cycle of those funds. Let's move on and let's start. So let's understand a little bit more about private equity and venture capital funds, the vehicles that actually make those investments, whether they are in early stage companies, in startups, in which case they are venture funds, or in later stage, more established companies, in which case they are private equity funds. So let's have a look at the life cycle of a private equity fund. So private equity funds are what we call closed end funds. What does that mean? That means they have a finite life, usually up to 10 years, but uh, at times they have the right to extend their lifespan by another two years. So every private equity fund starts off with a fundraising period. Once the first closing has been achieved, meaning at least 60 to 70% of the fund have been raised, sometimes 50%, we basically start with the investment period. That means we have a first closing at which point the private equity firm can invest in private companies and start to deploy their funds. Uh, we then talk about the holding period, usually between five and nine years per portfolio company. And uh, by year three or four, we usually will see the first investment, ex the first exits happen, meaning invested companies are being sold. Now, let's see what it starts with. It really all starts off in private equity with deal sourcing. What does that mean? That means the private equity fund is looking for suitable companies that fit the fund's investment mandate. Now, a private equity firm, and I'm using here a, uh, an example from uh, Bridgepoint, a mid-market European buyout fund, uh, a fund will look at up to 800 opportunities per year. That's quite a lot. They may do preliminary due diligence on 150, so very quickly they will try to narrow it down to suitable investments. Then basically present about 35 of those investment opportunities to the investment committee, meaning the partners in the fund that make the investment decisions ultimately. And then we'll do formal due diligence on about 20 investments. So there's quite a, um, uh, quite a funnel that, uh, that we're seeing. Ultimately, on average, private equity funds will make about five investments per year. So from 800 that are incoming uh, interests or that your deal sourcing team has basically surfaced to five deals ultimately done. So there's quite a bit of hard work involved on the way from deal sourcing to deal execution. So the private equity process itself is a simple business. You buy, whether you buy a minority or majority stake in a private company, you grow the company, you improve it over that holding period that we talked about right at the beginning, and then basically you sell the company again. So obviously there's a lot more to be said about it. So we don't, we, we want to do justice to all those private equity firms out there. Whilst it appears to be a simple business, there is a lot of heavy lifting, especially during the growth period where those deals, those acquired companies need to be made successful. So you should consider private equity investors, very, very hands-on players who bring basically operational, 
uh, experience to the table that should ideally complement that of the management in the company. They will uh, uh, manage basically the impact and will single-mindedly focus on the, um, the execution of their investment mandate. So that is clearly a, uh, an, an opportunity to, uh, to explore. So players in the private equity and venture capital fund are important. So again, it's back to language. Let's try to, uh, to understand and get that language straight, which we will be using basically in every further lecture. So GPs, GPs are the general partner, meaning those are the senior partners in a private equity firm. GPs manage two key relationships. On the one hand, they manage relationship with their LPs. LPs are the limited partners. Those are investors in the fund and they're called limited partners because their liability is limited to the money that they're investing in the fund. But they're also managing the relationship with their portfolio companies. So what exactly does that mean? Towards the LPs, the private equity firms have a fiduciary duty, meaning if in doubt, they need to decide in favor or to the benefit of the LPs. And they obviously have um, committed to generate ideally outsized returns for their LPs. If that is done well, that will clearly impact future fundraising. So if the relationship with the LPs is, raised, is done well, we will be raising many more future funds after the first one. Now, with the portfolio company, the private equity fund will need to manage the relationship with the management team. That obviously is important because as large as the industry is nowadays, it is still a pretty close circle. So word will clearly get out if a private equity firm is not dealing in an appropriate way with the management team in a, uh, a portfolio company. So managing the portfolio company relationship well will impact future deal making, i.e. will you have access to future deals? Now, let's have a look at the generic private equity fund structure and just very high level. So as we said, private equity funds are closed end funds, usually raised for a period of 10 years. In those 10 years, the LPs will in, uh, invest the money in the private equity fund. And by the end of the 10 years, they will have returned, they will have received their funding back, their investments back, ideally with a, uh, with a positive return. So the LPs invest in the fund. They are called limited partners because their liability is limited only to the uh, capital committed to the fund. The private equity firm, the sponsor also in some jurisdictions, will basically allocate, a, will create a special purpose vehicle, also called a GP, a general partner, that is usually staffed by senior partners from the private equity firm. The GP is responsible for the execution of the deals, for deal sourcing and execution, and ultimately is also responsible for uh, the fiduciary duty towards the, uh, the LPs. The GP will also invest in the fund, usually anywhere between three and 7%. It can be more in, uh, in very few funds, but usually the GP will invest in the fund to align the interests between the GPs and the LPs. The LPs call this so nicely skin in the game. We'll come to the profit sharing and the fee structure in a little bit. So there's a manager or advisor that is part of the private equity firm, which manages basically the day-to-day -day business, deal sourcing, reporting, and so on. So basically uh, administrative functions in the private equity fund. Once this fund has been raised, the fund is basically ready to invest in portfolio companies. Like we saw about five investments per year. So for each fund, we will see private equity firms do about five uh, to 15 investments out of each fund. Now, this was one fund, but what makes a successful private equity firm? A pro successful private equity firm will, after let's say 20 years, be able to look back at a family of funds. 
So they will have raised fund number one with their fundraising investment and divestment periods or exit period, if you like. Um, in year three to four of fund one, usually we will see them raise fund two. In year three to four of fund two, we will see them raise fund three and so on. Usually this is determined by the amount of funding left in the predecessor fund. So as soon as about 70 to 80 percent of the fund has been spent, i.e. investments have been made, we will see that uh, a successor fund is being raised. So let me recap that private equity firms raise a new fund every three to four years. Once about 70% of the active fund have been deployed. What drives the fund size? Usually you will see that fund one was smaller than fund two, fund two far smaller than fund three, again, in a successful private equity firm. It usually is determined by the target market, the number of opportunities that the fund is expecting uh, to see in the coming five years during the investment period and basically also to some extent basically off the, on the sweet spot of the, um, of the private equity firm, meaning what is our ideal deal size that we're seeing out there. So now let's have a look at the typical cash flow on the LP side, on the investor side. If you are an LP in a private equity fund, what kind of cash flow, what will your cash flow look like over the 10 year lifespan of the fund? We refer to this as the J curve. And as you will see during the first five years, which is basically our investment period, you will see basically a negative cash flow. The dark green line here is the cumulative net cash flow that the LP will see. That means we will see what we call so nicely drawdowns. The private equity firm will basically call for capital if and when they are ready to, if they found a suitable investment and are ready to deploy. From year six onwards, then we will see the J curve latest ticking up because we are starting to see exits, meaning funding is flowing back to the LPs because those portfolio companies are being sold. The moment the companies are being sold, the capital is not reinvested. It is being returned to the LPs with the respective profit or con compensating for the respective loss. Now, fee structure and private equity is usually casually referred to as two plus 20. So two being the management fee, 2% per annum on capital committed, dropping down to about 1.2% on capital investment as invested as the money is being deployed. So management fee is your first layer of fees. Secondly, the GP will receive in return for, its, uh, for the work that they're doing, the deal sourcing, the deal execution, the management of the portfolio companies, they will receive a 20% profit share, also called carry. Carry is basically the net profit, 20% of net profits that are going to the GPs. Ultimately, the 2% management fee is being paid annually to keep the lights on and on the GP side. That means to pay for office rent, for travel, for, yeah, for staff, and so on. But what the GP really is working for is the 20% profit share. So we will come to that in a small exercise that we'll do as a quasi part three later on when we look at the, uh, uh, at the distribution of the carry. In the context of LBOs, leveraged buyouts very often, um, we will talk about uh, so-called hidden fees, fees that are being charged to the portfolio companies, board fees, holding of portfolio companies, director's fees, advisor fees, and so on. So we will basically circle back to it in one of our later sessions. 
overall, so the fee structure in private equity is not uh, super transparent. And private equity has improved uh, the way they are reporting back to their LPs in the last couple of years. Nevertheless, there's, uh, I would argue, there's still work to be done in terms of disclosure. But ultimately, it's the LPs that basically manage uh, what happens in private equity as they are the ones that can ask for improvement. So returning money to investors, the, in, when we talk about exits, we will hear, we mentioned carry already, the profit share that goes to the GP. So how is basically the funding distributed? So number one, we have step one, we return basically uh, initially out of all the profits and out of all the money returned after we sold a portfolio company, we will first return all the money to the LPs, the money that the LPs have invested in that specific deal. We then will pay to the uh, LPs a hurdle rate, meaning a preferred return. So before the GP receives its carry, its profit sharing, the LP will need to receive a hurdle rate, means usually between eight and 10%. Then in step three, again, always assuming that there's still funding available, the uh, GP will play catch up, meaning this GP will receive everything that pro rata that the uh, LP has received in step one and two. And once there's more funding left, we will ultimately split all the remaining uh, proceeds from, a, uh, from an exit 80-20. 80% to the LPs, 80% will go to the LPs, 20% will go to the GPs, that's my carry. So ultimately, at the end of the fund life as well, that's how the math will be working out. So we will have a part three where I will step you through a worked example on how carry works for those of you that would like to dive deeper. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for joining me again. And I look forward, if you liked this session, then uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel. I will be posting uh, videos, uh, video lectures on a regular basis, usually on a weekly basis. Thank you very much.